Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so my topic is actually uh, somewhat related to the previous talk, so it's actually very logical to put them uh, at the same uh, uh, session. <clears throat> now, before I start, I saw most of you have had a morning of at least two excellent technical talks, so I'm going to switch gear a little bit and just uh, talk about uh, uh, some things related to uh, the reason why we do all these things. I think a lot of times engineers and scientists get easily absorbed into talking about what we do, and we get very excited and talk about all kinds of interesting stuff. But a lot of the, a lot of times what's lost in the translation is actually why we do all this stuff. What's the, what's the whole point of doing research? What's the whole point of doing technology? And uh, I don't know how many of you are truly enlightened about that question. So before I go, I'll ask uh, everyone to uh, answer my question by raising your hands, right? So first of all, how many of you likes to play games? Any games? 100%. Even Jimmy's hands come up. That's amazing. <laughs> I saw he didn't like games. How many of you likes to make money? <laughs> Jimmy's hand. You? You seem right. <laughs> Are there people who don't like to make money? <laughs> One hand? No? Right. Change your mind halfway through. All right. How many of you likes to do research in the lab? Late at night. <laughs> 12. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say 12 p.m., nobody's here, and you just like to do research in the lab. Yeah. Can you raise your hands really high? <laughs> okay, this is a very good crowd, I think. <laughs> Typically, no hands come up. How about 2 a.m.? How many of you likes to do research at 2 a.m.? Just do experiments. And some of the hands go up. All right, so that's what I expected. Okay, a lot of times uh, we, we find this that there are a lot more people who like games, who likes to make money, but they don't like to do research. And the reason is because you never find the connection between doing research at 12 uh, a.m. in the morning and making money. And that's pretty sad, I think, for a lot of engineering students. So one of the things that I always tell my students is that uh, you know, we're not here to just learn somebody else's research. We're not here just to learn some lab techniques. We're here to have fun, we're here to make money, to make serious money. And if you don't know how to make money or how to have fun from the work that you do, then you really, you really need to figure that part out before you do anything else, okay? And unfortunately, that's a part that a lot of people never teaches you. And I can't teach you in the, in the time that I have. I have to talk about some technical things too. But uh, I would just, uh, I just want to uh, you know, kind of switch gear and also keep everybody focused on the larger picture. The larger picture is that technology is fun. All right? Technology should be you know, beneficial. Uh, and uh, I don't want people to get lost in the, in, in the focused research and looser and think that science is somehow just, just work. So uh, this is, uh, we all know that the World Cup just finished, right? How many of you, you know, like to uh, watch soccer games? All the hands from all the US students come up and none of the Asian students come up. That's what I expect. Because <laughs> the United States people really love soccer. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, we all know that there's a, there's a, you know, international game, and whoever wins is, it's a really big deal. But we all know that there are, you know, these are some of the stars, right? Everybody in sports, in basketball, in, in uh, music, in soccer, in Olympics, have their own games, and they win, and they get, you know, to be on the world stage. So the question that we always ask. Or, or we never ask ourselves, is as scientists and as technologists. 
what is our game, right? Are we here just to be some kind of developer, or are we here to play a game? And I, I would argue that we're here to play a serious game. So everybody has tournaments, right? There's tournaments for soccer, there's tournaments for dancing. This guy, by the way, is a co-founder of Apple. Okay? It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, this is a, we all know Steve Jobs. This is the other Steve, and uh, he is a co-founder of Apple. And there's dancing, there's singing, basketball, golf. Everybody has their tournaments. Where's the tournament for cyclists? Can someone tell me where is our tournament? Tomorrow afternoon. Ah, there's, there's a tournament? What's the price? The price is the best poster price. Best poster award. Best poster award. Oh, that's really exciting. Okay. trying to make fun of the best poster award tournament. But you know, what is the game? All right? What is our game? Can someone answer me what you know as technologist? You know, where's your big stage? Eric Brumby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll. You market your product. Huh? Marketing your product. Marketing your product. Okay. Wonderful. That's our game. Yeah. Okay. So you want to be a salesman? <laughs> uh, I don't have that skill. Okay. So when you say marketing, typically that means you're you're in sales. Yeah, I wish I had that. Okay. That's okay. I, I think what you mean is developing a product and yeah, trying to so. make it, you know. Why? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know. Just you know. what's it? Producing patterns. That's a good game. A big game. Yeah. Yes. Nobel Prize. Huh? Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize. Oh, that's a game. Wow. We need Nobel Prize. And uh, and uh, you know, making patterns. Making patterns is a pretty good game. You know what's the uh, you know any revenue of a company called Qualcomm? You know what Qualcomm makes, right? What? CDMA chips for cell phones. The annual income of Qualcomm is $21 billion. You know what percentage of that comes from patents? That the entirety of that $21 billion is patent licensed. All right, so that's a pretty good game, all right? So uh, a lot of people don't understand what research really is. Okay, research is our game. We always, oh, we're researchers. We do research. What exactly is research? Okay, a lot of people don't really know. You know, what's the relationship between research and and our game, which is patent? Can someone tell me? You know, how can you go? How can you make a patent by doing research? How can you make a patent? Patent is a vehicle to get rich. How can you make a patent by doing research? Yes. Yeah. Uh, find something different than before. More creative, more in another thing. Yes. Also to create a human life. Convenient. Create a human life by doing something different. Yeah. So we we do the research. Okay. Or create more. Okay. Convenient product. Okay. Uh, more, uh, more interesting for Okay. 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 Now, first of all, making a product is not called research. Okay? It's called development. Yeah. Research and development are two completely separate things. The first, the first is research. Uh, I, I don't think so. Research and development are two completely different issues. A lot of people call, you know, in, in Asian culture, we always say, oh, research and development, R&D. But R&D are totally two different things, okay? And you've got to approach R&D 
with entirely different mentality. Research means finding truths, means creating knowledge. Okay? And D means making a product, making developing something. And that two things are entirely different. Okay, so when you call your researcher, when you call yourself a researcher, or when you say, oh, I want to have a career in research, you gotta be very careful to make a connection to that game that you want to play. How do you do research and make a patent? Okay, let's say I don't want to do research, I just want to do development. Okay, how do you do development and make a patent? That's the real question that everybody needs to ask yourself, okay? A lot of people have very very fuzzy idea, ideas about what research is, have very fuzzy ideas about what development is. They think, oh, it's just whatever we do in, at, at school. That's not true, okay? You can have, you can do things that are just curious and interesting, but doesn't really matter. Doesn't really rise to the level of research and development. And even if you just do research and development, it doesn't mean that you can find, you can find gold, okay? So there, there is our game. That's the game. And everybody needs to know the big game before you start to learn the techniques. Okay, I find too many people don't know the, why they do that, and they just get absorbed into the techniques. So typically, research means finding truths. All right, there are several steps of doing research, and you need to take them step by step. You need to do it in a very thorough approach. The first step of doing research is to ask a question. Okay. You have any topic you want to do research on, you ask a question. If you don't have a question, then you don't do research. All right? Let's say, you know, if you work in, you know, TSNC, Taiwan Semiconductor Microelectronics Corporation, and your boss comes to say, hey, you know, Tommy, why don't you make our next product? Okay? That's not research. Because your boss never asks you a question. Okay? He says, go make the next product. That's not research. It's development. Okay? So research means you ask yourself a question. Let's say you ask your boss, okay, how, how much better do you think it has to be? Well, that's not really a question, but you're starting on the track of asking a question. Okay? If there's no question, there's no research. Secondly, you develop a plan to answer that question. Okay? And you have to be able to defend your plan later. And then you conduct a lot of experiments. This is why you have to work at 2 a.m. in the morning. Because you got to do all the experiments to execute your plan. And then you explain your experiments. Okay? If you just do experiments and get some results, and you can't explain them, you don't understand them, nobody else understands them, you say, hey, here's the result, boss. That's not good. You got to understand it. Okay? That's why you have to work until 4 a.m. in the morning. Because you know you can't go to sleep after you find the results. You really, really can't wait for the next morning to figure out why. Okay? Then you ask more questions after you find out the reason. Okay? You do this a few rounds successfully, there's your PhD degree. Alright? That's what research is. So research is very different from development. And the game that we play, at least the game that I play, I work in the arena of microelectronics, all right? So this is the flow of microelectronics from the days when John Bardeen and his colleagues invented the transistor at Bell Labs. And then people made transistors, this leads to, uh, this leads to uh, you know, hard disk drives, MEMS, uh, sensors, optoelectronics, uh, memories, sensors, microfluidics, you name it. And this gave rise to many, many industries, okay? semiconductor industry. You have integration and fabrication technologies. And this give you computers, this give you cell phones, this give you personal entertainment from all the industries. You know, if you're from Taiwan, then you know what is the, you know, what's the pillar of the regional economy, okay? The pillar of the regional economy is somewhere here, okay? And it's all sank to a tiny little 
Nobel Prize winning development in 1947. Somebody invented the transistor. If this never happened, then the Taiwanese economy would be totally different today. Entirely different. All right? So this is the game that we play. And it's very important to keep these pictures in mind because we're not here just to make a, a cool novel device and talk about it. We're here to play the game, understand what the answer to a question, and then execute, file for the patents, and wait for money to come to your way. That's our game. Okay. A lot of people don't understand this. Okay. And uh, so I just want to make everybody aware that I'm going to be talking about MEMS and bio-inspired sensors, but they amount to nothing. Everything I talked about is just for fun. All right? You can't ignore my, the entirety of my, my talk, and you're not going to lose too much. But this is a slide you don't want to lose. Okay? Always keep in mind that you are on this arena, and there's a purpose. All right? Make a differentiation between research and development. Any questions here before I move on to the really boring stuff? Yes? How difficult is to combine both development and research at the same time? So you can develop like a product to mm -hmm. answer a question. It's uh, probably a hard answer question at the same time. Oh, sure. Yeah. It's a, that's actually part of the reason why I do what I do. And I'm going to try to tell you why the, the, the kind of work that I do, that try to combine some research and uh, product development uh, efforts. It's not easy, and it's not too hard. Uh, but you got to do it right. And you, make, you want to make sure that there's some results at the end of it. That's really worth something. Yes. You talked about patent. Which which one the, the which one is most not important but the easiest one, hardest one to get? Is that the research patent or the development patent? Or is there any one of them? A research patent or development patent. Uh, now first of all you don't just get a patent. You know how expensive it is? file for a patent? No. If you have an idea today, if I have an idea and I want to have some patent protection, do you know how much money it's take, it takes to just to file for that patent? No. Somebody had some answers? Yeah? Maybe 2,000? 50,000. Huh? 50,000 to have that protected well. It has to be drafted by a pretty qualified you know, patent lawyer who knows how to use a language, okay? But that's only in the United States. So, well, I want to protect it in China, I want to protect it in Taiwan, I want to protect it in Europe. That's four regions, 50K each. You need 200,000 US dollars just to file for a patent. So, first of all, you don't get a patent. You pay for it. A lot of people don't understand this at this stage, okay? Patent is not free. So what does that mean? If you want to file for a patent, where do you, you know, find the first two hundred thousand dollars to even get your ideas patented? Why would the university pay two hundred thousand dollars for, let's say, I file for a patent? Right? How do I convince the university to pay two hundred thousand dollars? for my crazy idea to be protected. Do you think the university would willingly do that? Sometimes. Sometimes? That's $200,000. 200,000 US dollars. A lot of money. Yes? The, how about the plan is, uh, I mean, the research is coming from an industry business. Yeah. The, the same value of money or this different? It's the same amount. So the business will pay for it. That's assuming you're in business. 
Yeah. Out in the school. Yeah. So it's better to do the to look for a pattern in business yeah. than academia. Which one is safe? Uh, I wouldn't say that. I, I think I think academia a lot of times our development is more original and industry is more developmental. So it's different. Okay. But yeah, industry has more cash and they can pay for more money. Uh, you know, I can give you examples. For example, uh, uh, you know, how many of you drink coffee? A lot. You drink coffee. Do you know a machine called uh, Nespresso? Yeah. Nespresso is a uh, is an instant you know espresso maker made by a company called Nestle in yeah. Switzerland. It's a it's a market hit. Okay. It's a, it's a machine like that, you put a pouch of you know, coffee in there, it will make you a pretty nice espresso, uh, satisfying a lot of European standards, actually. Do you know how many patents are there in that single machine? I know it's expensive. There are 7,000 patents in that single machine. 7,000, and it covers every region in the world. So. You can do the math and figure out how much money you have to fork out just to apply for a patent to be in the game. Okay, so I want you to remember that there's a game. Uh, we do research so that we play that game. We don't do research just for fun, just to have some, you know, things to talk about for our friends. And secondly, that game is really, really rewarding, but it can be very expensive. Yes, do you have something. Yes, like um, how uh, university decides in... They don't decide. They don't know which one is important. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you file for patents and somebody, if, if they decide to copy you, they will do everything they can to not pay you. They will, cop they will, they will go around you. So first of all, your patent has to be really good. And your patent has to work. That's why you work until 2 a.m. in the morning, all right? You, you, if somebody is going to pay $200,000 just for you to file for a patent, you make sure that patent works. You don't file for a patent that doesn't work, okay? Because the next guy will file a modification of your patent that works, and that guy will get all the money. That guy will get all the reward, okay? That's why you work until 2 a.m. in the morning, okay? So hopefully, I, you know, this is actually the part that I enjoy talking more than my own research, is to make sure that you know the stake, you know the reward, and you know the rules of the games. Too many times, the researchers that we produce don't know anything about this. Okay, and they, it's like you know, playing basketball, but no, you know, doesn't know any rules. That's that's no good. All right. So I'm going to talk about my own research. And uh, first of all, I'm from Northwestern University. I don't know why the why this thing was not changed. Uh, I changed this morning. It doesn't. It's not reflected. So this is not the University of Southern California. And uh, I come from Northwestern University, and my lab is called Medics Lab. And Medics means that uh, we do medical-related sensors, transducers research. So uh, MED means medical applications, and X means a number of things. It means uh, uh, excitement, cross-disciplinary research. Uh, it also means question marks, uh, extremes, mystery, you name it. So I kind of like that name. And uh, my group's research focus is to advance engineering research for medicine and health. But first of all, I was trained as a MEMS researcher microsensors research. So a lot of the work that we do focuses on micro device engineering. Uh, but you know the device is part of a system and the system is part of a product that a consumer can touch. So I'm not happy just to make devices. I want to make the, the things that consumers can touch. So the application we focus on is medical and health related. Uh, but in university, you know, if you just make devices for applications, that's development, okay? I don't want to be working at a university and do development. At a university, you need to do research. 
that means you need to dig into fundamentals. So we also like to uh, have some interaction between our device making efforts and science. And that hopefully will answer some of your questions. On the engineering side, we not only make devices, but like the previous speaker, we like to use new materials and uh, we have to go to the system level research, not just at the device level. So this is kind of a schematic of the scope of research in my group. And the particular approach that we take is bio-inspired engineering. And uh, by that, uh, we mean that uh, we learn things about the biological systems, more specifically sensors of, bio, uh, of the biological systems and then apply the design inspiration to engineering. And then we use such engineering devices for applications. And this is a two-way street. First of all, uh, I think in engineers need to be inspired. Okay? If our whole goal is to make our boss happy and make the next product to beat our competitor, I don't think that's a very exciting life. I think our goal is to make a product that will beat nature. Okay, nature has some of the, the world's best sensors out there, as our previous two speakers have mentioned. Uh, so I think learning from nature give us, you know, give, at least you know, makes our research more inspired, more motivational. On the other hand, there are a lot of unknown open questions about nature. And uh, typically those are studied by biologists. But biologists don't know too much about engineering. They don't have access to a lot of the new engineering tools. So I think by having engineers study nature, we can actually help biologists finding out information about nature. So that you know, satisfies our kind of you know, dual role of studying nature as part of research and making devices as part of development. So that's why we can have, a, I think, a healthy flow of research and development in a single group. <clears throat> this is a picture uh, showing you that uh, you know, early on that people have been studying nature and get a lot of reward. All right? For example, this guy, uh, his name is uh, Edward Maybridge. He was a photographer, uh, but he's also an engineer. So he developed uh, the first, basically, movie camera that can take very fast actions. And somebody, a very rich guy, cut. Leland Stanford, the, uh, the uh, founder of the Leland Stanford Junior University in uh, Stanford, California. Uh, he wanted to study whether uh, you know, he's, a, uh, he's an avid uh, uh, writer of horses. He actually breeds horses. And he wants to know if the four hooves of the, of the horse left ground at the same time when, when the horse is running. And that's a question that nobody knows. So until that Edward guy figured out how to make a camera, nobody knows whether the hooks left. Right. Okay. Now, of course, we know the engineering benefits of that inquiry. Right. So interestingly, Stanford you know, wanted to do research. His question is, you know, what is his research question? Are the holes of I remember all off the ground at the same time? Yes. So he had a question. Do all the four hooks leave the ground at the same time? And so the way that he conducted the research is to first build a camera system <laughs> that nobody had. And then use a camera to take pictures and frame two is evidence, two and three, that shows yes. I I can answer that question, right? But there's a tremendous engineering benefit of that effort that give the, the entire movie industry, what we call the movie industry, Hollywood and movie stars, and all the glamour, came from bio-inspired research, I would argue. Okay. So in my group, uh, we are very interested in a system called hair cells, biological hair cells. Hair cells, uh, thanks to the previous speaker makes my job a lot easier. Hair cells are used in many, many biological systems. Okay, in our hearing organs, in cochlea, 
are the surface organs of insects. Uh, they can be used to sense flow and vibration. On the legs of spiders, they can be used to sense the uh, movement of air. On the surfaces of fish, they can be used to make the natural line system. And uh, even on the wings of uh, uh, flyers, for example, on the wings of uh, Bats, okay? So they can be used to adjust the maneuver. So this is a very fundamental sense of building block in nature. And uh, since around 1996, uh, even when I was a, a young faculty here, we have started to uh, use men's technology to build artificial hair cells, to build the biomimetic version of this. And uh, our work has been uh, has actually led us to work with, with a lot of biologists. And I think I'm not going to talk about this slide. Uh, this is a cochlear slide to talk about how the hair cells uh, sense uh, motion, uh, sense the uh, acoustics. Uh, this is a video showing you, I hope it does, uh, showing how the hairs on the legs of spiders work as a basically as a flow sonar that allows the spider to detect the position of moving objects in the air and then catch it. Okay. So this is a video taken by a biologist, a friend of mine at, uh, in Austria, uh, Frederick Barst, and he's a world's leading expert on developing uh, understandings of how the spider, how this particular spider works. And, uh, so in this particular video, they have this spider sitting on the ground, and then they have a uh, they have a fly that's attached to a moving stage. So the fly is beating its wings, and the stage is moved by uh, using a computer-controlled uh, motion system. And you can see how this spider responds to the uh, fly. We don't typically see jumping spiders, yes, but there are jumping spiders out there. It isn't, it's being webs, it's, it's much more ferocious. So uh, what they have found out very amazing, amazing, is that the spider hair sensor on the legs of the spider can detect movement. If you measure the movement at the tip of the hair, this spider looks like a pretty lowly you know, animal can detect motion as small as four angstroms, 0.4 nanometers, okay? If you move the hair by four angstroms, the spider knows. So that corresponds to exceedingly small flow, uh, flow speed. So if you compare that to the state-of-the-art flow measurement system that, that are engineered today, you will find a lot of accomplishment that the nature has already made. And uh, for example, this is the, uh, what's called the hot wire anemometer. This is an industrial standard for measuring flow. And how it works is that there is a resistive <coughs> wire and uh, you pass electric current to heat it up above the ambient temperature. Okay, just like when you pass you know, airflow from your hand, you can cool your cool the surface of your skin. So if flow moves across this wire, it will take heat away. It will reduce the temperature of the element, and in turn changes the resistance. So that's why it's called a hot wire anemometer. You can measure the resistance while you apply a little bit of a heating power, and then using that information to sense the motion. But this is a very expensive system. This system typically costs about 600 US dollars each. And uh, it has to be attached to a signal conditioning system that uh, reduces the noise, do filtering, and do all kinds of stuff. And this box itself is about $6,000 each. All right? So compare this individual system of $6,600 to a lowly spider hair. I hope you get the picture. Animals are really good at some things. I 
don't know how, I don't care how they're so good at them, but they are really, really good. They're not only good at, you know, basically the material part of making a device, but they're also very good at signal conditioning and all kinds of games that human beings haven't figured out how to do yet. And that's the basis of our research. So my question, if I were, uh, you know, I am doing research, but one of the questions I would ask is I really want to find out how does the spider do that? You know, why are they better than our transistor systems? Right? And how can we make our man-made systems as good as nature and as probably as low cost as nature? So those are the research topics you might <laughs> Any questions here? Yeah. How do, do, does the spider feel? Uh, I know it does the motion, but it senses the, the material that is moving around. Yeah. So when you have the uh, when you have the air media moving around, the air molecules interact with the air to uh, exert a drag force, and that drag force causes this air to move back and forth. Yes. So would the actual air need to be still for them for the spider to actually recognize the fly when you guys bring it by? Did you guys test that? Well, you know, for example, when when you're sitting in this room, mm -hmm. do you feel the draft or no? But there's one there. There's draft, right? That's very strong signal for the for the for the spider. Okay. So what we call you know still air in this room is not so still. All kinds of so of course, you know, if the air is dead still, it doesn't move at all. Then the spider does the same. But you know, that's really the case. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. So what I'm going to show you is what <coughs> we have done to make the artificial version of this hair and. Uh, show you some of the uh, performance measurements that we have got. Okay. Unlike our previous speaker, who uses nanotechnology to make the hair, we use microtechnology. And there is a reason, at least for flow sensing, to use a technology that gives you bigger devices. Because bigger devices can be useful for measuring flow and give you better sensitivity. Because if your hair is too short, then you cannot measure the movement of the flow as, with as high sensitivity as a longer hair. So uh, our group have been working on this uh, artificial hair cell sensor for uh, like uh, eight to 10 years. And uh, we have made several generations of devices. We have made silicon-based devices and polymer-based devices and uh, soft polymer-based devices. We have made many generations of devices. Here's a picture of a silicon uh, version where we have a silicon cantilever with a photolithographically defined hair on the end of this cantilever. And at the base of the hair, we have piezo resistors that changes its resistance when the, uh, when, the, when the hair moves. So imagine if you have fluid coming this way, coming from right to left. It's going to exert force on the hair, so the force will be pointing to the left of this hair, and that force will cause this cantilever to bend, to actually bend down. And then that, that will induce stress concentration at this surface and change the resistance of the dome silicon resistance. So like I said, uh, the velocity of the hair, of the hair translate into force. Force uh, can be integrated over the entire length of the hair, and that gives you the momentum, gives you the torque acting at the base of the hair, and then that torque can be translated into relevant change of the uh, resistance. I'm gonna, not going to explain all the theories about this, uh, but one of the advantages we have gained by using this bio-inspired approach and men's approach is that we can actually build hairs into large arrays, and we can have hairs of different lengths and heights. So they can be useful for measuring, uh, they can in interrogate the 
same flow field. And uh, by using different lens, and, uh, they can have different resonant frequencies, they can have different sensitivity level. So we can fine tune the dynamic range and fine tune the frequency response range of the device. So we can really make a very complex field of you know, hairs that can be useful for you know, very sophisticated process applications. And uh, of course, you know, here you learn some basic fabrication processes, and we combine different processes like doping and uh, lithography, metallization, uh, etching, backside etching, etc to make this device. Our name of the game is to develop a process that has really high, uh, really high processing yield. And uh, this is the measurement result of our device. For example, here, the uh, flow sensor is characterized in air and uh, in water channels. And uh, they show this parabolic response that if you take into account of the uh, viscosity and density of the fluids, then those two curves are actually the same. And uh, we have shown that uh, indeed we can develop arrays of these devices to have hairs of different geometry, different morphology. We can have two hairs that are crisscrossed 90 degrees apart, for example. We can have hairs with different lengths of the cantilever so that they have different resonant frequency and we have hair that can be spaced at uh, whatever uh, uh, predetermined locations that we want. So we can really make an array of hairs just like the spider uh, has. Any questions? Yes? How fast do they respond to that? How fast it can respond? That's a good question. Uh, the uh, resonant frequency of those devices in steel air is on the order of one to three kilohertz. So they can respond to the flow movements as high as about you know, three hertz, uh, three kilohertz. And uh, interestingly enough, we find out that when the fluid is moving, and sometimes when you have very low speed velocity, when you have very low velocity, it exerts a force and causes the resistance to change. To change. If you have very high speed motion of the fluids, then what happens is uh, many of us have the experience, you know, when you see a, a flag pole with a flag, okay, and the wind is really strong, you see the flag beat. Okay. The flag beats because of uh, a uh, phenomenon called self-induced vibration. Okay. So the fluid moves back and forth self-induced vibration. And we find that if you have high enough speed, those micro machine micro flag poles will also beat. And so at very high speed, we can have very high frequency beat on top of the motion created by the motor. So therefore, using a single hair, at low speed, we can use the amount of torque to measure flow. At high speed, we can switch over to the other mode of using the frequency of beating to measure. So using a single device, you can cover quite a large dynamic range. Yes? So this is not, this is not my field, but I, I read about it in journals and so forth. Yeah. I, know that, um, I, I know that there's a there's a figure of merit. When you're trying to decide what material you use, um, here you're using dope silicon, but I think that the, the advantage is that you can machine it directly into your, your device, right? Yeah. But when, when researchers are looking for materials for these kind of measurements, I think there's a figure of merit called the gauge factor. Right? Yes. yes. So different, different materials have gauge factors, and I think that's the push to move to nanomaterials. Um, some of the nanomaterials have these maybe these enormous gauge factors. Yes. You only have to move them a little tiny bit to get a very substantial change. Absolutely. In, 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 in resistance. Right. I was curious. Um, it, does anyone know what the effective gauge factor is on a spider, like what other spider um, oh. apparatus? Can, can we know that? Uh, we have to do patch plant to their, to, to, to their cells? And also, yes. uh, by, by comparison, is, is that a factor that you measure? To, to, uh, That's a great question, Michael. Um, I think, uh, you know, first of all, I think there's something very intriguing about 
the, uh, how the hair cell actually works. The hair cell, uh, as many of us know, neurons encode signals into pulses. So they use the frequency of the pulse to indicate the strength of signal rather than the magnitude of the pulse. So this is something that, as an electrical engineer, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with the way that electrical engineering represents signal, either by magnetic voltage or by uh, you know, frequency. But we rarely, uh, either by voltage or by this, uh, what's called frequency modulated signal. But we rarely use the frequency of the signal pulses to represent the, the strength of signal. So there's, there's one intriguing question that I don't think many people have asked nor answered. Is why does the nerve system use the, the pulse system? So uh, I think if you, uh, the, the, the Austrian biologists, they have used patch clamps, uh, single neural uh, measurement to look at the pulse correlation to the motion, so that's how they got to that. But exactly what's the equivalent gauge factor, uh, I don't know. It has to be awfully high. But uh, uh, I think you asked a very, very good question. The, uh, um, the piezoresistivity gauge factor of silicon depends on the doping level and on the uh, crystal orientation. And it can be as high as 120, and can be as can be as low as five. So it's a superior measurement. Uh, uh, it's a superior transduction principle compared to you know, elemental metal gauge uh, So that's part of the reason why we why we use this. I think when people use, for example, nanomaterials for as gauge factor, I think that's wonderful. We, uh, uh, we could, I think, maybe with nanoscopic effects and, and things like that get a better measure, but I'm not a, I'm not an expert on the net material that you're familiar with, so. But one thing that you have to consider uh, when you think about the, the, the name of the game is eventually, if you want to mass produce this kind of systems, uh, then where do you go? <coughs> TSMC, there's no other place on Earth that you can do this. And I learned it the hard way. Everybody talk about CMOS compatibility. How do you make your process compatible? But if you want to make money in the semiconductor field, you make your device through TSMC. Okay? And uh, uh, PMP, you know, many people are here are from Taiwan, so you know TSMC. Uh, there's only way to make your process compatible with TSMC. And that is to be exactly like what they are doing. Okay? If you, if TSMC used 100 nanometer resistance, uh, photoresist at this step, and you ask them to change it to 105, they will say no to you. They don't do that. Okay? They will kill their entire process. Okay? So the only way to be compatible with CMOS founders is to be 100% compatible. So there is there lies a challenge for both the nano technology researchers is eventually how do you mass produce your things at significantly economic cost. And that uh, I think is something that fundamentally a lot of us are gonna need. Because if you don't have the mass market, then you don't have the investors. Investors only invest in the mass market. And uh, the only way to make a product that satisfies the mass market is to make it cheap. The only way to make it cheap is to go through TSMC. And the only way to go through TSMC is to make your process entirely compatible. That's what TSMC asked. Yes? There's a lot of back-end line fabs now, though. Yes. You can take the electronics from uh, the CMOS fab and yes. go back in the line. I know most magnetics companies have to go that way. Absolutely. Yeah. There's no way to put magnetics in the stuff. Right. So um, that Very. might be it's futuristic. Yes. TSFC is not the only way to go, but they are the, they are the powerhouse. Well, you go after them. You, go back huh? and you take something from them and do a back end. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. 
there are, there are ways, actually, there's advantages in doing that. Because one of the biggest concerns of doing everything with TSMC is that TSMC knows everything that you're doing. You lose your intellectual property. So a lot of companies, smart companies, uh, actually uh, uh, intentionally leave a few steps out of this. So they do the last few steps. But that's expensive steps. That's where, that's, you know, what costs money. TSMC is like a high-speed train. And then after you get out the high-speed train, you, you get on a bicycle and go home. That's, 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 uh, you really need to know the name of the game at the beginning of the game. You can't just go along and figure out the game. That's why you need to work on the two a little more. Okay? It's just to learn all the game rules. Basketball may have a game rule like that. Engineering have a game rule for this thing. Okay? The only way to read it is to read it. There's no other way to go. Unfortunately, there are not many people teaching it. So many people are not even aware that there's a there's a rule book that's it. So, but that's a great question. Um, so uh, one of the things that we can do, one of the benefits that we have of using the hair cell is to take the biological approach where you make a single hair cell and you know the hair cell in biology can be used to measure acceleration, flow, touch, and uh, maybe even magnetic field, if you're clever enough to put magnetic materials on here, uh, and other things. So our goal is to make the same hair, and one can be used for flow sensing, and the other one we can use them for measuring other things, maybe touch. So here we can actually make sensors and uh, embed them for touch sensing. And uh, this is a very interesting picture. I, put this device right next to the next to a US penny. And uh, many of you are from Taiwan, so you probably don't know that there's a real Lincoln in the middle of the, uh, you know, when you're in the lab in the afternoon, you can see that. There's a real Lincoln. Uh, kind of looks like, a, you know, it doesn't look like real proportion, but it's, there's a real Lincoln. And our device is much smaller. It's about the size of Lincoln's head. And that's a individual area. So the market that we are trying to go after, you know, after all, what, what I have done is wonderful, uh, but it doesn't warrant anyone to pay $200,000 for me to file for a patent, because there is no use. There's no economic return. If I work at Northwestern University, and the Northwestern University patents people look at this, say, I'm gonna spend $200,000 so that you can have you can have a what? You can have a patent certificate hanging on your wall. That's the most expensive you know, picture frame that you ever have. What's the point? Okay. The point is there's got to be some use. So the application that we're trying to go after is actually medical marketing. So in this particular case, uh, one of the applications we are, we are shooting for is uh, medical dialysis machine. So the, Medically, there's a lot of vein access machine that allows an instrument to interchange with your body fluids, uh, blood and other, uh, other kinds of fluids. So you need to have fluids in and out. And in case of, uh, you know, for example, many people are familiar with dialysis, but there are many more life critical applications. For example, renal, uh, there's a, pr a process called renal dialysis is if you're you know, if, you're, if your kidney ever fails, then you don't want to die. And you can't find a oh, you know, organ donor, then what are you gonna do? It happens a lot in, the, in this world, okay? You can sponsor research on the tissue engineering, but that's not gonna happen very soon. Uh, so one way to go is to do a process called renal dialysis, where you draw, basically take you take the blood from your body and basically use a machine to clean it and then return the blood to your body. Okay. So basically because your kidney fails, it cannot do the job it, it normally does. But that's an eight hour procedure. And uh, with the uh, world population growing and uh, the, uh, a lot of the 
government and your stress. It's impossible for anyone to think that that kind of process will be done in hospitals forever. So there's a growing trend of moving that kind of instruments to homes, okay, to, to uh, maybe even portable units. Those kind of systems need to be cheap, but it needs to be very reliable. Namely, if the machine is clogged or it's moving fluid is too fast, you want to stop the process. You want to alert the patient. So we are building flow sensors that can be used for that kind of applications. And that needs to cover a very wide range of fluid flow, from very low fluid flow to very high fluid flow. Okay. And uh, by the way, you know, the reason that we do medical care or home medical care it's very obvious if you look at this chart. Okay, this chart is the world population growth. And uh, this is North America, this is us. This is Asia, it's a much bigger base to start with, but also with a much faster growth rate. This is Africa. Uh, so you can see that this kind of trend is predicted for the world for the next 20, 30 years. Okay, and there's no reverse to it. And every government has to deal with it. And there is shrinking wallet. Okay, and there's shrinking budget. That's why we try to put sensors into medical instruments. Okay. So I'm gonna just talk about two more slides before I finish. Um, so one thing that uh, we have been very interested in is actually to build the lateral line system. The lateral line system is a is the uh, flow sensing organ of fish that measures the fluid movement around its body. And we have been having a lot of fun with our uh, biologists, researchers, to build the uh, array of flow sensors just like the lateral line system. And uh, this is this is pure research. Okay, this is uh, research we have from friend of mine at Harvard, uh, George Lauder, and they developed a, a measurement system to look at the uh, activity of muscles of fish during motion. And they find out that uh, you know, a fish actually saves a lot of energy by interacting with the vortex that are generated in, in the fluids to save, to save energy. Okay. I don't want to go through the details. But this is pure natural science research, and they find out that, of course, it's com uh, uh, confirmed that the lateral lines are very important. And uh, I work with another biologist at uh, Bowling Green University, Cheryl Coombs, and she does research on fish behavior studies. So this is a fish moving around in a man-made uh, field of uh, obstacles. So this is an aquarium. There are a lot of Lego obstacles, and there is a fish. This fish is a, it's called a blind cave fish uh, because it's a, found, it's a fish that is found in very deep, dark waters, and for you know, maybe for hundreds of thousands of years, their eyesight has completely gone, and actually their eyes are completely gone. So this is a blind fish that doesn't have any eyesight. And so people believe that they use the lateral line organ entirely for navigation. So this is the first time that this fish is introduced into this fluid field. And this is actually not moving fluid, but really stationary fluids. And uh, the first time you can see that uh, this uh, poor fellow is uh, trying to move around and uh, uh, trying to find out information about the field. And uh, this is the second time that this guy is here. Okay? This is the starting point. And you'll be amazed at how fast it can move. This is a blind fish. Okay. We can ask many, many questions by watching this video. But the point that I want to make is that biology has something wonderful hidden from us. It's either in the design of their lateral line pairs, or in their uh, neural system, or in, in the structure of their brain, or in the architecture of the hairs uh, in, the, in the lateral line. That's just astonishing. And uh, they have 
a lot of secrets. And by doing research, we can find out how they work, and we'll be able to uh, use that information, hopefully, intelligently, for developing engineering systems that are useful for certain applications. Okay, maybe applications, maybe, but for uh, you know underwater robot, uh, other kinds of applications. So I'm going to stop here, and uh, I spend a lot of time talking about the big picture because I think for most of you, I think understanding the big picture is very important, and I don't believe that any school will have any program that really talks about it. In the big picture. And if you don't know the big picture, then you don't know the small picture. Okay? After you know the big after you know the big picture, then you know why you should work really, really hard. And, uh, and you should know that's the pathway to fun. That's not the pathway to labor and more. Alright? So I'll finish here. Thank you.